for uh, April 21st today, and we are um, really pleased to be able to pull together a session for you today um, to help everybody digest and sort through all the options that are out there, um, changing every day really for small businesses and nonprofits to receive funding relief during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we're joined today by some great speakers. Uh, we have Bill Flynn of Coastal Community Capital on the line. Thank you for joining us, Bill. You're welcome. We have, Happy yeah. to be here. Great. We have Matt Cronin of Boardwalk Business Group, who's going to provide us with some of the accounting and payroll side of, of everything that's available. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Lauren. Glad to be here. And then we have Lisa Oliver and Peter Rice of the Cooperative Bank of Cape Cod, and they will be providing the banking side and their perspective on implementation of, of the different loan and relief programs that are out there, kind of what they're seeing. So welcome Lisa and Peter. Thanks, good to be here. Thank you. And I want to just take a minute to thank um, the Cooperative Bank. They are actually our presenting sponsor for this whole series, including this session. And we're really grateful to them. Uh, we've had a great run of, of all of these sessions. It looks like this one's gonna be our most popular one yet. Lots of questions out there and we're so appreciative for their partnership and collaboration uh, to be able to bring this information out uh, to our community. So thank you very much. Do you wanna say a few words, Lisa? Sure, we've, um, I think this is now the fifth in the series, um, Lauren, of these um, virtual chats that have been happening. And the only thing I can think about is how much the world will change post pandemic as we've gotten used to trying things that we never had a reason to try before, like virtual conference calling and, and remote work environments. So um, some of the things that keep me up now is getting through the initial phase of adjusting to this new world. I just said to Megan when I dialed in this morning, I hate to admit it, but I'm starting to get used to working at home where the first four weeks I was completely struggling. Now I'm thinking I'm going to miss that extra casual coffee in the morning and not racing out the door <laughs> and some of the um, interesting work-life balance opportunities that you get. So um, it's been great to be part of it, to see it unfold, to see um, the technology struggles I certainly am still having and all of us seem to have in getting used to the new, the new space. But it's great that we're able to keep things rolling and um, have these conversations and share best practices. So we're, we're thrilled to be a sponsor. I'm looking forward to the conversation today too. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a lot to dive into here. And I think what we're gonna do is um, start with a bit of an overview of, of what's out there. Um, I think we're gonna first turn it to Bill Flynn with Coastal Community Capital, which is a community development organization here on the Cape. And they work uh, closely with the SBA to provide um, options to small businesses and, and nonprofits when they're qualifying for these programs. Um, and before we turn it over to Bill, though, I just uh, want to remind everybody that we do have a chat box if you have questions that come up um, while one of our speakers is going through um, their main points, please uh, feel free to pop your questions into that chat box and we can make sure they get addressed. Um, we are also recording this session uh, to share through our YouTube channel and social media platforms and we are for the time ever on a virtual connect and chat on Facebook Live today. So hello to everybody out there on Facebook watching. Um, thanks for joining us. And please, uh, as well, feel free to submit your questions and comments there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, who I believe has, uh, are you called in, Bill? I did. I, I'm sorry. I don't have my, my uh, video on. Uh, I'm under the uh, Maggie box today. Uh, okay. But uh, I do want to welcome Janine Marshall in, who's the executive director over at Coastal, who probably would uh, uh, want to say a few words and maybe take. Oh yes, please! I didn't realize Janine yes. was in my so, apologies. Speaking of technical difficulties, I had some getting Hi. in, but now I'm here. So. Welcome. <laughs> 
So um, thanks, Bill. Uh, so we are a, um, a nonprofit community development uh, financial institution. We're certified by, for those of you who don't know who we are, we're certified by the U.S. Department of the Treasury as a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution. We're an SBA lender. And then we get a lot of funds from the USDA for rural development lending. And that may become very important because as I'm hearing about the new um, allocation or the reauthorization of the Paycheck Protection Act program, um, I am hearing that they're looking to allocate, I think I heard maybe 60, 30, 60 something billion dollars towards rural communities, which is great. So um, all of Cape Cod is uh, deemed rural by the United States Department of Agriculture. So if that holds true, then maybe there'll be some extra funds that we can allocate uh, specifically to the County of Barnstable. So having said that, um, what we predominantly do is commercial lending, small business lending. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, technical assistance and a lot of group training. We've been doing an awful lot of the one-on-one, -on -one, which has been, I have to tell you, very heartwarming for, for me to do because we've had so many calls from so many small business owners that are just so concerned, don't qualify the, for the Paycheck Protection Program. Did, did apply for the idle loans. And of course, that's been very slow to get off, although we are hearing that people are starting to get those funds now. But um, we've just been trying to, you know, almost talk people off the ledge, frankly. You know, they're just extremely concerned. And, and so everybody who has called us or emailed us, we have personally called them back to talk to them put them on our email list and then we update them with every new blast we get from the SBA, from the feds on unemployment insurance on everything. So um, if you have any information that needs to be um, out to, we have, I think we have maybe 8,000 um, email addresses that we blast out to all small business owners, just let us know. So quickly, you just wanna run through, I think most of you are probably familiar with the Paycheck Protection Program. Sounds like it's going to be reauthorized. Lisa, that means you and Peter are gonna be extremely busy again, extremely busy, but all doing very good work. And so the Paycheck Protection Program uh, was um, really uh, put together to provide paychecks for the eight weeks following the, um, the date of your first disbursement. So, and we've heard from a lot of small business owners who've been very concerned about the seasonal business owners. The intent, I think the, the government's intent was that they wanted to put a paycheck into people's hands while the economy is basically shut down. So we hear from a lot of seasonal owners who say, well, it doesn't really apply to me. And unfortunately, it wasn't geared towards the seasonal owners if you're not um, collecting a paycheck, but uh, if you're not open during that period. Although you can, um, the good news is, is that if you do open by, um, yeah, I think the funds have to be expended by uh, the, well, you have to use the funds, I think, from eight weeks after the last the last date, which, and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, which is June 30th, I think. So you do have a little bit, is that right, Bill? Eight weeks, eight, eight weeks from the disbursement date, yes. From the disbursement. So if you've got, so with the second round um, coming, which we think it's coming, you know, if you've got the disbursement later, then it might take you into part of the season. And that's my point. For those businesses that aren't seasonal, it's a great program. We've had a lot of our, um, our SBA borrowers apply for it. We finance a lot of B&Bs, hotel motels, restaurants, things like that. So we've had a lot of um, people apply for it and, and been recipients. I think the COOP is, was the first bank that I heard who actually closed the loan under the PPP. So congratulations to you. I think that was a, a big achievement, particularly here on Cape Cod. Um, so the Paycheck Protection Program, a uh, great program. Is there anything else, Bill, that you want to mention about that? Uh, no, I think pretty much uh, most people have uh, done a lot of research on that, hoping that it's going to be able to uh, at least st stabilize their business and their employees during this critical time for everyone on Cape. Yeah, and one more thing we would recommend. So if anybody has specific questions, because things change daily with the SBA. The SBA is still interpreting the act, so you, you have to cut them a little slack because in, in, I think they said in 14 days, they did more business than they ever did in 14 years as a result of the Paycheck Protection Program. So um, uh, they still are interpreting the act, but if you have any specific questions, certainly feel, um, uh, feel free to reach out to us. And the, I think the most important thing too is I think most banks are keeping their portals open. Are you keeping your portal open, Lisa, for these applications? 
I, I can myself. I can. Um, we we are you. Yep. You can't submit them to the SBA. The SBA portal's closed, but we absolutely have a list. We're still working with clients now to yeah. take applications, get them all completed so that when the portal opens, we can submit. Yeah. So for any small business owner, if you need help getting your materials yeah. together, give us a call. We'd be happy to do that. I know other Cape Cod banks are also keeping their portals open in anticipation of a second round. So that's very important. Um, and now actually, you know, if, if you're putting your uh, materials together, it would be a good time to run them by your lender or your banker just to make sure you have everything in hand. Because we did hear from another bank that the majority of the applications coming in were missing critical materials. That slowed down the whole process. They couldn't get the SBA loan approval. So it's a good time to reach out to either us or to reach out to your banker while the, port while, you know, the program is not funded. See if you can get your materials together and then you can submit them and get into the queue for when the funding does come around. So, um, so the could other you, thing. Oh, could you could you talk as well? Incorporate some information about who is eligible and how they qualify for that program. Yes, funded. So, um, and Bill, help me out here. But the the Paycheck Protection Program is really um, if you have employees. Uh, you can apply for um, the amount. What they did is they looked at your 2019 tax returns and they uh, figured out what your payroll was for the entire year, divided it by 12, times it by two and a half, and what, that was the amount that you could apply for. That includes uh, benefits, healthcare benefits, and includes um, IRA contributions, simple IRA contributions, and things like that. So we did hear from some people, a lot of people actually, because you didn't have to have your tax returns filed on the, um, you know, in March or in April of this year. Um, people did not have their financials together. So we would encourage everybody to get your 2019 financials together because the banks, at least correct me if I'm wrong here, but the banks are asking for that documentation. They want to see either from your, if you have, if you outsource your payroll, um, they want to see from your payroll provider exactly what that number is. And most payroll providers are, um, have a portal that will provide you with exactly what that number, the calculation is to submit to your bank for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and so that's important. So that is how much you could apply for. Um, and I think that's pretty much what most um, people are receiving. It's the two and a half times your average monthly payroll plus benefits from last year. Anything I else think it's else? important to note, Janine, um, and I do have Peter Rice on the phone, who's the head of my commercial lending group, um, that the banks, the way the, the rule is written is it's up to the business owner to supply that data. So although the banks get the information, we're just trying to make sure the documentation is there. There's no additional calculation done on our part, nor are we reviewing financial statements as a normal loan request would, would go through the process. We're literally just getting payroll data. Um, it, but the burden of calculation and the burden of knowledge lands on the back of the um, the borrower um, in this case. And so I would urge people if, if it's, because it is very confusing. We've heard this from big companies, small companies, have somebody like Janine and her team help take a look at it to make sure you're, you're calculating in the right direction. We kind of give it a second eyeball. So if something seems way far out, someone's asking for $500,000 and they have annual revenues of 25,000, we might say, okay, there's probably a problem here. Well, <laughs> let's go back to the drawing board. So we're trying to catch the obvious the obvious ones. Peter, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, the, the only thing um, you summed it up well, I would just say that the, um, you know, the rules that um, the SBA put out there and its so-called interim final rules are pretty detailed. Um, it, did, it wasn't without maybe some questions, but um, we have found that uh, people are reaching out to their accountant in some cases. Uh, a lot of payroll companies have stepped up and really provided the specific information that they know people need for this um, program. And the one thing that we're trying to kind of double check, just to your point, Lisa, just to make, some, make sure something's not wildly out of line, because if it is, it runs the, runs the risk that, uh, that, the, uh, that the amount will not be forgiven. And that's, that's important as well. Yeah, so that is the most important part of the program is that if you spend the dollars like you told uh, the bank and most importantly the SBA that you would spend the dollars, then that money will be forgiven. And uh, if not, 
um, then the balance would be due and payable within, uh, I believe it's two years from the date that you receive them. So the forgiveness portion has been, a, I think, a big driver in the volume on this program. And we are, we're certainly um, counseling all of our businesses and business borrowers that you need to document, 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 because at some point the SBA may come back and ask for that documentation. Uh, and if the loan was forgiven, you want to make sure that you have the proper documentation in hand. So spend the money like you said you were going to, which is pay the people that you said you were going to pay and, and, and document everything for the forgiveness piece. Um, the other program that I don't think it's going to be reauthorized, but it was the, um, the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Everybody heard about it. Uh, once again, uh, fully subscribed, uh, is, not, is no longer available. We heard many different uh, ways that the SBA was calculating how much a small business owner would get. Um, and we do, in fact, know of um, a small business owner that uh, heard over the weekend, he was going to be receiving 243000 This is after on Friday when we heard everybody was only going to get a max of 25000 So I, once again, you have to be patient with the SBA. You know, they are working through these programs. Uh, and, and now, luckily, they are working through approvals on the disaster loans. I think a lot of people, um, we in fact applied for a disaster loan and we received a, um, a small deposit in our bank account over the weekend. So um, people were, who, who applied for the disaster loan, uh, which is a 30 year loan at 3.75% fixed for the entire period or a little less for a nonprofit. Um, and you could use the loans for any type of working capital um, originally, everybody was going to be getting a $10,000 automatic advance. That has been backed out to um, what I've heard you know, from the SBA on Friday was that you get $1,000 per um, employee quick advance. That advance will be forgiven. Uh, if you don't get the loan, we're still not clear on whether that advance is going to be forgiven for everybody. Um, so, and we're also hearing now that, you know, most of the loans are going to come out at 25000 per business. So, uh, but, but finally, we are seeing some movement on that, uh, putting much needed cash in, in small businesses' hands, because a lot of the people who didn't qualify for the Paycheck Protection did qualify for the disaster loans, and um, it's very important dollars to get in their hands. So, no longer available, but still the cash is flowing, so that's good to know. Janine, uh, we've had a question about uh, 1099 employee qualifications for um, either of these programs or anything else that you might know about. Yeah, so 1099s, uh, I think the state just launched the their portal for um, unemployment assistance. So 1099ers are eligible for unemployment assistance. Um, if they didn't get the email blast, they should reach out to us. We can certainly send that along. Um, but that is for, I'm just going to read here from the unemployment website. It's for um, self-employed individuals and 1099 contract employees um, and um, gig workers, freelancers, independent contractors. Um, uh, so you can now apply um, on the state's website is my understanding. So for unemployment, but not for uh, paycheck protection or anything like that. Okay. No. Okay, so any other programs that we might need to be aware of? I know there's so many moving pieces with these and even um, the Paycheck Protection Program, as you briefly mentioned, is currently, if people are keeping up with the news, I just checked again this morning because I thought, well, maybe late last night they might have reauthorized some additional um, funding, but it's just really a, um, you know, at the mercy, I think, of, of what kind of deal they can get done. But it looked like they were considering um, an amount that was even higher than the original amount. Is that correct uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program? So originally it was $350 billion, and they're looking at another $500 billion to add. Ooh. I have not I heard, heard that. But, yeah, I have not heard that. I, I'm more interested really in... I'd like to see some of the dollars allocated to the very small business owner because those are really the people that we're hearing from that just don't qualify for that paycheck protection and really need the cash badly and need it now. So I, yeah. like I said, once again, if some of the dollars go to a rural communities, then that would certainly help us out a lot. And I they are looking, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Lauren, I was just gonna say, I think what you may be hearing is that um, the Republicans and the Democrats, Democrats have a different, um, 
target for this. The Republicans just wanted to get the extension of the PPP program out. Democrats wanted additional funding for hospitals um, and um, you know, state and local governments and to say, hey, all of these organizations are struggling. So when you see the numbers, there's two different ones. I don't think the PPP, the size of that pool of funding has increased much from the 250 that was originally spoken about. I think the balance, if you see a larger number, is what is being earmarked in that um, bill for hospitals, for healthcare providers, for okay. um, other organizations that are helping fight the, the cause. Okay. Yeah. So Janine, you're hearing that some of it might be essentially designated or earmarked for rural communities, which is something that Cape and Barnesville yeah. County as a whole could take advantage yeah. of. And Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Okay. We have a question. Do you know anything about large national change res chains receiving PPP funds and how the qualifications might change if the fund is reopened? So that's been the big news story the past couple of yeah. days is, um, what was it, Shake Shack? And I don't know how much that impacts us here, except that, uh, you know, of course, there's a limited pool of funding that everyone's kind of trying to get at. Taking money out of the children's mouth. It's taking food <laughs> out of the children's mouths. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there were big national um, restaurant change in particular because I think there was a, I don't want to call it a loophole, but hospitality um, companies could apply for PPP loans. So very, very large national chains were able to apply and get, and get funding. Um, I know one of the ones I was just reading the Wall Street Journal this morning that had received funds also just got another round of equity. So they're going to re be repaying their original PPP loan. So that one's still gonna, going to unfold, but um, certainly kind of went against the grain of what the intent, I think, of the PPP loan program was initially. I know there's lots of different relief funds that are popping up too. I think the U.S. Chamber had one. I was um, adding that to our, we, for those that aren't aware, we are working really hard to keep our resource page on the CCYP website updated, and there's a whole section of small business and nonprofit resources. They're actually separated into small business and nonprofit because in some cases uh, they're different. Um, but for the US Chamber program, that website was completely locked up yesterday. It's, some, it's basically a grant program uh, for small businesses uh, to receive a, a little bit of funding that would not be a loan-based um, uh, opportunity and that website completely crashed yesterday. So I think there's just a huge demand out there. Can you speak to, um, you know, what that demand has looked like for, for you on the ground? And I, I think for Janine and Lisa, I want to hear, and then I'd like to turn over to Matt to kind of talk about um, what he's seeing as well from his perspective. Uh, well, I can start. Um we have seen a huge demand. I mean, it's just amazing. Every business is affected by this uh, by this tragedy. And so um, we would like to see, definitely like to see more funds flowing. We are working with um, two of the towns uh, regarding initiatives. One's a grant initiative, the other one's a um, low interest loan initiative. Uh, so we're trying to get those programs together and um, and get them launched. And so hopefully, you know, that can provide some more immediate relief to um, local businesses. Um, and I, I would urge, um, you know, I, I think we need more programs for the small businesses. So I think you need to call your legislators and tell them, you know, the funds, we need funds for the very small, the, the 10 or less, 20 or less employee businesses. And really the only way we're going to get some traction on that is to, you know, pick up the phone and, and call uh, your legislator, congressman, you know, senator, and let them know the pain that you're seeing down here because there's a lot of pain going on. <clears throat> Peter, you want to speak to, to volume and need a little bit? Um, sure. So, you know, we saw um, more than 500 applications flow in over the course of uh, really just a couple of weeks, which is, you know, an enormous volume. It's, it's more, you know, loans than we would normally process in a year and a half or more, um, all happening in that short period of time. And our focus, uh, recognizing that there was a lot to do, not only in the front end with um, approval processing applications, getting them approved by the SBA, but then as they sort of flow through the process, you have, now you have to document 500 loans and you have to close 500 loans and fund 500 loans. And 
Um, so, so we focused um, first and foremost on that approval stage and really threw resources at it, um, recognizing that at the end of the day, we, we'd rather have a tough conversation with someone say, sorry, we didn't maybe communicate as well, but we got your loan approved as opposed to the other way around. So we got 500 um, applications approved at the SBA and, and, and very quickly transitioned that into the um, documentation and funding stage. So we, we have worked our way through documenting and funding the majority of those at this point, still, um, you know, still some to go, it's a process. But, that, you know, obviously our focus is get the money in the hands of businesses so they can get them in the hands of their employees to uh, keep people employed uh, or bring people back to work if they had been laid off and get money in their hands to help um, the businesses and the local economies to uh, stay strong and be able to participate in, even if it's a scaled back economy at this, um, at this point. Um, you know, we certainly learned a lot of lessons in the process. Some of the key things, you know, if, this, if PPP opens up again, which I'm really confident it will, um, you know, things that we learned in the process that uh, would be helpful for folks to know is really the key is a complete application, obviously. Um, and that payroll information um, really is, is important and needs to be information that's got some authority to it. And what I mean by that is, you know, a, a W-3 that summarizes your annual payroll or four quarters worth of the 941 form, which is, um, which is also official. Um, failing that, a, a report from your payroll company would be helpful because they summarize the same data very well. And with those, with those two things in hand, which are really the critical two, two documents, that enables us to process them very quickly and, and answer the questions we need to as we move through the approval process so that we can um, get them moving. But certainly, we, we get back to people when there's things missing, and, um, and it's important you know, for people to then respond and back with whatever may be missing so that we can uh, keep it moving. Great, thank you. We have a question. Uh, will the Main Street program and other Federal Reserve programs have any effect on local banks' ability to underwrite loans and increase liquidity? Sounds like a coop question, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, I mean, it's a, so that Main Street program is a, uh, it's, it's a little different than the PPP program. It's by and large, I would say it's, it's designed and intended to help larger businesses in general. It's not that it can't help smaller businesses, but clearly the um, sort of the formulas and the, um, uh, the guidelines around that program are geared towards some larger businesses, that said. Um, smaller businesses can participate. It is a it is a loan that is not a forgiveness program. So that is a um, it's a it's a fairly conventional loan with conventional terms to it, and um, and it is something that smaller businesses can apply for. Really, the benefit the the main difference between a typical loan and um, and that is that the the uh, Federal Reserve has agreed to to participate at the 95% level in that loan. So that, so from the bank perspective, it removes essentially 95% of the risk from that loan. So it allows banks to facilitate those loans much more quickly and easily than they otherwise would from a um, uh, underwriting and, pro and process perspective. So we haven't gotten a lot of applications for that. I suspect that the reason is because it is a much more complex program to sort of navigate and understand and um, with uh, really a lot coming at everyone quickly, I, I, my, my gut is that just sort of small businesses haven't had an opportunity to really kind of, kind of digest all the rules around that, you know, candidly, but sure the banks have had uh, an opportunity to digest all the rules around it. Great, thank you. I want uh, Lauren, one thing I do want to say is, is that uh, from our perspective at Coastal, the SBA lending community is still open for what we call traditional loans, which might be a debt refinance program. The SBA loans are at historical lows right now and the lowest, low threes uh, in that area. So the opportunity does exist for uh, businesses that are uh, thinking on a long-term basis versus the uh, short-term uh, capacities of the PPP or the EIDF to, to, to perhaps, uh, you know, do some debt, debt refi at this point also. 
Someone needs to go out at some point. <laughs> That's Howard. He's saying a lot. Thank you. I'm always terrified that the mailman's going to come while I'm on. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So, so I also was reading Bill that, um, and, and Janine as well, maybe that there, there's a forgiveness option. If you have a current SBA loan that was just introduced, do you have anything that you want to share about that? Yes. So uh, that was a great program uh, that um, was part of the CARES Act. So anybody with an existing 504 loan, which is a, um, an SBA loan product used to finance commercial real estate. So we have used um, 504 loans to finance a lot of, once again, hospitality, hotel, motels, restaurants, service base, things like that for landscapers. And anybody with an SBA 7A guaranteed loan, those loans will have their payments made by the federal government as a debt relief. So it is, it's not a loan, it's not a deferral, it's actually debt relief, um, does not need to be repaid back to the federal government. And so um, those, uh, those uh, that debt relief has kicked in for the 504s on April 1, and I think on the 7As it's kicking in on, um, on May 1. So very important part of the program and, um, and greatly appreciated. We sent out a blast email to all of our borrowers and I can tell you, you could just feel the love coming through the phone when everybody got that email. They were just thrilled to have that, um, that relief. Yeah, every bit helps. Well, I wanna turn it over to Matt Cronin now with Boardwalk Business Group to tell us a little bit about uh, what his company's been um, experiencing and, and I know that they've been supporting a lot of businesses and small uh, nonprofits as well in their application process for the Paycheck Protection Program. And we've had a question specifically about calculation of um, when the application piece of that program. Um, so Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what you're observing and, and what you've seen so far? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Um, absolutely. So, you know, uh, what I'll talk a little bit about is, um, you know, what other small businesses are doing and, and should be doing if, uh, you know, if you're not. And I really kind of break it down into five key points. Um, the first one is to create a cash flow forecast, right? Uh, it's something that uh, sounds pretty straightforward. Uh, it can be simple. It doesn't have to be uh, extensive, but if you haven't done it, you should do it. And if you have, you have to update that on an ongoing basis. It's important on an ongoing basis during this time to, to understand, you know, what, what's called your cash runway, how long your cash, uh, you know, should be good when you might need an infusion of, of additional cash. Uh, number two, uh, it's what I call uh, have a cash flow team. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, the team uh, includes some of the people on the call now, right? So that can be, uh, it's important to, you know, to have uh, your banker as part of the team. Um, and that also includes customers, vendors. Uh, if you have uh, trusted advisors, uh, such as a CPA, uh, it includes, you know, key employees and uh, financial employees or outsourced finance as well. It's important to know who those folks are because the communication, the third point is that you have to really enhance the communication with all of those folks at this time so that you can understand that you're taking advantage of the opportunities that exist and understand and utilize their, you know, their expertise and strength. Um, number four is to be proactive in the discussions. Listen, you can either not have discussions, you know, with, with these partners, you can have reactive discussions, or you can have proactive discussions where you really, you know, um, initiate the conversation and the tone of that conversation. Uh, so it's important to be kind of really think through how to be proactive with these, uh, you know, business partners. And lastly, number five is to be persistent. Um, uh, with your communications or really, you know, we're talking weekly communications, you know, at this point, we're talking a much higher level of communication than you normally you know, might consider as a small business manager or owner, um, as well as, you know, as I mentioned, the cash flow forecast, uh, it's important to, uh, to really update that much more frequently than you would otherwise. Um, I did put together, uh, we have a, a cash flow forecast. Um, I, I don't know, Lauren, of the easiest ways for me to quickly just share my screen. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, let's see if I can do this here. Um, so basically what I'd recommend is that um, your cash flow forecast um, should really be like a, again, it doesn't have to be anything that's, you know, uh, you know too crazy. Uh, it basically kind of looks like a bank statement for, for the bankers there, right? Um, it's week by week. Uh, uh, if you can see that, uh, uh, for simplification purposes, I've included, uh, in, uh, included three weeks. But my recommendation would be that you have a rolling three, 13 week or three month analysis where you're looking at beginning balances, uh, where you're looking at cash inflows, uh, outflows and ending balances on a week to week basis. All right. So a couple key important points to, to consider. Um, your collections from your customers are different than what you bill out, right? Uh, so this is where we get into kind of cash versus accrual accounting. Uh, you, obviously, this is cash inflows. So this is not what you're billing. This is what you're able to collect, uh, you know, on a week by week basis. Um, uh, on the expense side of things, you want to be detailed. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in this example here, we have uh, utilities listed. You might actually want to you know, be more, more detailed and break it down into you know, electricity, gas, uh, cable. Uh, in doing so, what you're going to do after you put this together is really analyze each of the, the pieces and components. Okay, uh, you, know, you know, can I uh, wait to, you know, to make a payment here or there? Or can I do without one of those utilities? Like, for instance, you know, you probably can't do without, you know, electricity uh, or uh, gas. However, you can work with those vendors to defer payments. And you might, be, you might say, you know what, for the time being, I'm going to do without cable. And so uh, putting together this spreadsheet, um, you know, and there are a lot of templates out there. I'm glad to email, you know, a template like this to, to anyone that sends me an email, uh, matt at boardwalkbusinessgroup.com. Uh, you can also Google SCORE, which is a great uh, additional resource that we're all familiar with. You could uh, uh, find, they, I know they have a template that I've seen. Uh, but putting this on paper and then updating it on a weekly basis is real important step uh, that you want to do at this time. Uh, not only is it important for you, but as you work with, you know, a coastal community, as you work with uh, the COOP or, and or other banks, you know, you can share that and show that you've, you know, um, that you're analyzing this, you know, intently and closely and that you, you know, know, uh, you know, projecting, you know, what your cash position is going to be and when you might need to have additional cash inflows. Um, so, um, that being said, I have a few, uh, quick tips, you know, that I found, um, um, that I will, uh, share with you, um, in terms of collections, you know, consider, uh, invoicing up front. It's really amazing to me that, uh, I saw a statistic that said $900 billion on any given day, $900 billion is owed to small businesses. It's actually not surprising to me though, because, um, it's often overlooked, uh, the, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, of the timing of invoicing um, and, and collections. And so that's something that you can really uh, enhance, you know, uh, is, you know, think about, you know, some businesses, you know, don't wait to send an invoice at the end of a period and then give 30 days to collect it. Some businesses ask for payment at the beginning of a month, okay? Uh, you have contractors where they ask for a deposit up front and uh, payments at certain milestones. You can think about how you can begin to implement those with some uh, engagements moving forward. And at the same time, you wanna create, uh, basically from your financial system, a list of outstanding receivables that um, uh, you know by customer, and you might have say you have 17 uh, you know outstanding you know customers with outstanding balances. Well, go through that list and literally prioritize, number them one through 17. At the beginning of every month, what I recommend is that if you're managing your collections, then uh, block off time on a Monday afternoon. Say Monday from two to four is my collection time. Uh, whether you're doing that or you're having someone, you know, in your company or out, outside of your company do that for you, block off that time and begin to communicate, you know, and make this a higher priority so that you can 
uh, kind of be the squeaky wheel, so to speak. Notice I use the word communicate. I'm not suggesting that just putting an invoice in the mail every week is what you want to do or continue to do. Um, what I'm actually suggesting is consider calling, you know, uh, when you have that list of customers, enhance the communication, consider actually calling them and or emailing them and having, you know, discussions. Everybody knows the situation that, uh, uh, you know, the businesses are in, uh, in this country right now. And uh, the more that you can have conversations with these customers, the more that you can uh, be creative in terms of, you know, how you uh, suggest payment be made. You know, you might have a customer that owes you $5,000. Think about it differently. Think about, okay, uh, maybe on a weekly basis, you know, we can get a, an agreement in writing where, you know, $500 is paid each week over the course of the next, you know, 10 weeks. Um, and you can then, you know, implement that and input that into your Excel sheet and your cash flow so that you can actually see, you know, if that'll work for you and what the impact that will have for you. So it's important to kind of, uh, again, communicate, not just with your customers, but on the other side of things as well. Um, you know, I will say for our nonprofit friends on the call, um, if you have donors, keep them informed, remind them why your work is important. Uh, you know, give them the opportunity to help. We're all in this together. And we, you know, I found a lot of people that want to help. If you go to a donor or a potential donor or some sort of partner with a well thought out, uh, you know, communication as to how they can help and what they can do, uh, then, you know, you're more, more likely to, you know, uh, to have success with that. If you have donors that have made pledges, uh, you know, consider asking them to advance those pledges. If there's $5,000 that's, you know, going to be uh, collected in December, you know, ask if they'd be open to, you know, uh, you know, to paying that soon. If you're a nonprofit that's canceling uh, events or considering doing so, think about the donors who buy tables at those events. Have a conversation with them. Would they be open to, you know, uh, making a similar donation in that amount, even though, you know, you may not have an event. Uh, if you have events, think about deposits. Think about, you know, if you've already made deposits and, you know, work with those, uh, you know, vendors to figure out when you can get reimbursed. A um, couple other things real quickly, uh, and then I'll pass it back. On the payment side, we're in cash conservation mode, right? So all the businesses that we work with um, are wise right now to, we don't know the length of this, right? And uh, we don't know the ultimate impact. So it's very wise to be very conservative, you know, as a business uh, manager or owner at this time. Um, look at that list that I shared. Look at your cash flow that you put together. Figure out what's a must pay, what's a should pay, a like to pay, and what's a don't pay because I'm going to shut it down. You know, whether that's, you know, certain expenses, I mentioned cable as an example, or, um, you know, uh, potential dues or subscriptions or meals or what have you. Um, but again, be creative on this side too. If you rent space, talk to them, talk to them about extending payments. Uh, you know, you can determine whether or not you want to be kind of uh, proactive with those communications or not. Um, also, go through your bank statements, identify any expenses that are automatically debited, uh, that automatically come out of your bank account, and consider whether or not you want to stop uh, those. Um, even if you want to continue, you know, the service, stopping the automatic debit allows you to um, go ahead and um, uh, pay, pay those, you know, frankly, when you can by a check that goes in the mail. So really controlling the timing of that more so. Um, you know, the last piece of advice I'd say is um, talk to your insurance folks, talk to your insurance broker. A lot of times we might have a, uh, an annual premium that comes out of your account at a certain point in time. Well, and I know, you know, insurance companies are providing, uh, you know, incentives and are extending payments, but have that conversation as well because you don't want to uh, inadvertently have a multi-thousand dollar expense that hits your account when you could, you know, spread that out over a much longer period of time. Um, so lastly, you know, uh, your team, I talked about your team. I've found in the, you know, the folks that we work with, 
uh, you know, the local banks have been very helpful and folks have understood the value of having a local banking relationship, uh, you know, at this point in time. I've had a lot of people that have reached out to me and say, my, yeah, I have a national bank, X, Y, or Z. You know, I don't know who to go to there. I, I can't talk to anyone. I've found tremendous value in the conversations that our clients, you know, have had and that we've had with local bankers. And you might not have a banker, so to speak, um, you know, someone that you go to at, at, at a local bank. Um, but it's pretty easy to establish that relationship. You know, uh, Lisa and Peter and, and Janine here, you know, uh, everybody's helping everybody out. So you can literally go to local bank websites and see who the branch managers are, see who the people are that you work with, that you know, that you, you know, uh, aren't even thinking of, that you can reach out to and they can uh, help establish that relationship. As we've heard Janine and, uh, you know, Peter and Lisa talk about, um, there are other options that are out there, right? We're emphasizing these federal programs, but at the same time, this is an important time to have those discussions with your banker about the other options that are out there, whether that's a line of credit. Uh, in some cases, you might have a line of credit that, um, you know, and I think Bill mentioned before, rates are really low. Um, they're really low. So, you know, you, know, you might even, you know, consider uh, converting a line of credit to a longer term loan. I wouldn't suggest you do that without talking to the you know, proper people to ensure that that fits with your long term business uh, plans. But banks have money, banks are flexible and supportive. And um, you know, I, I found them to be really helpful and we really wanna to continue to work with them uh, at this point in time and continue to work with the other resources that are out there. You know, um, besides the folks on this call, I mentioned SCORE you know, and other businesses, you know, we've spent, as Lauren mentioned, we spent a lot of time uh, talking to um, people that aren't our clients just to, you know, to try to have a conversation and tr try to help them, you know, uh, take a step back, take a breath and put together a plan and an analysis that can really help them moving forward. There's a lot of businesses that are out there like that, that'll continue to help, whether it's, you know, uh, business management companies such as ours or CPA firms, uh, legal services that are providing pro bono work. You know, I found, you know, uh, the silver lining in all this is that people are stepping up and, and really helping each other. We want to continue to boost up um, each other and, and our businesses and, and help in, in, uh, in any way that we can. So um, th that's what I'm seeing, Lauren. And, uh, you know, glad if there are any questions out there, glad to answer. Thank you, Matt. It sounds like big takeaways, whether you're nonprofit or a small business or to really lean on those relationships and try to, uh, you know, foster those as much as possible with um, not just local banks, but other businesses and really relying on each other as a community, but also getting all that paperwork in order. And that's a great template that you shared. I'm sure a lot of people really um, appreciated that. What advice can you give as far as, you know, making sure that you have the right information to complete all these calculations that are being required, whether it's for the Paycheck Protection Program or a loan product. Um, a question from Peggy who, who asks about, uh, you know, can uh, other expenses like taxes be included in some of these calculations? You know, can, can you all speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, what I'd say, Peggy, is that um, there are certain taxes that can be calculated uh, as uh, forgivable, but it's minimal. It's uh, state taxes that the employer pays. Um, you know, oftentimes that might be uh, unemployment tax. Um, retirement contributions are part of the calculation. Um, um, and, you know, other amounts, don't forget, there are other amounts that can be forgiven with the PPP as well, which includes rent. Uh, includes interest on a mortgage obligation, includes utilities. Um, so what I recommend to folks, and I actually recommended it to, to our clients uh, in advance of the applying for the PPP loan, is not only calculate, uh, you know, what, um, you know, what you're eligible for the loan, but calculate what you think 
will be forgiven based upon your expense, your, you know, your spending, because it's not right. It's not always one for one. Not, not everyone is going to have a hundred percent of what they spend over that eight week period forgiven. Right. Um, and so it's important to calculate that if you haven't yet, or even if you're in the early stages and you've received, you know, a loan, you know, calculate that and understand that uh, the best source that I've seen uh, in terms of there's a, a quick four pager from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that specifically uh, lays out, uh, you know, what will be forgiven. And, um, you know, uh, but again, there's other great resources and, and talk to people and there are people that can help you, you know, calculate <laughs> what your anticipated forgiveness will be. And thank you. I want to just um, sort of wrap up our conversation by asking um, all of our speakers to, you know, maybe share one tip that you have as far as what our um, participants here on the call today can be doing right now i think that there's a feeling of you know well, we're waiting for a paycheck protection program to see if more funding comes through we're waiting to see if additional um, capital resources might be released in other ways uh, you know for nonprofits i think that there's a push that i'm seeing in the nonprofit sector for dedicated funding just for nonprofits there's a lot of um, hurrying up and waiting going on and the feeling i think that a lot of people have is you know well what what can i um, so what would your tips be for people that are feeling like they need to do something? Start with Lisa and, and Peter, maybe. Well, I think, um, Lauren, I think, you know, just Matt's comments were really, were really good and spot on in terms of keeping lines of communication open with not, not just, you know, um, your bank, but with vendors, with customers, um, to be able to talk about how uh, a normal payment scenario might be able to be changed to, uh, you know, to help you at the moment. Um, and, 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 you know, there's, there's, of course, two sides to that transaction, right? Everybody's in the, in the opposite seat at one time or another. Um, so that's one thing. And the, the other thing I would just say is we're, we're receiving a lot of, uh, this is more informational, I guess, not, not so much what can you be doing right now, but we're receiving an awful lot of questions right now from people who've just received their PPP loan and already wanting to know about the forgiveness. And I just want to make sure people understand that the forgiveness calculation is a result of payroll and those other um, expenses that Matt uh, alluded to that happened during the eight weeks following um, the loan closing and funding. So nobody can today apply for forgiveness because they don't know yet what their expenses are that are going to justify and determine that forgiveness. So, and to my knowledge, I, I, I might have missed that. I don't think there's even a forgiveness application that's been made available yet at this point. So, um, the, there needs to be a little patience on that. So, that's important for people to know because I think there's some anxiety around that. I think what I would add, I like what Matt was saying about have a relationship. Interestingly enough, in banking, and I think I started when the dinosaurs were walking the earth, but. Um, it, it was it used to be all about relationship and i think over time what's really happened with the advent of technology the powers in the hands of the clients to be able to pick and choose where they want to do what type of banking in business and get feedback or not really have any kind of relationship other than using the services that are being offered um and if and if there's something that comes out of this it would be to, to figure out the resources in a bank, to Matt's point, who's gonna help you with some of your business dialogue? Janine mentioned it and Bill as well. Who is that um, board of directors that you've got that surrounds your, your business, your nonprofit, your personal financial discussions? They don't have to be paid advisors. Um, it could be an industry group that you're using. Relationships are really important and we're kind of seeing that right now. We've heard from so many um, small businesses, maybe that bank with larger banks, that bank with B of A because they've got unbelievable technology and unbelievable um, services that people absolutely love. Um, but in some of those bigger banks, they felt really shut out because they couldn't get through or um, they, they didn't have, they had a checking account, but they didn't have a relationship, um, a loan relationship. And, and I'm not advocating one type of business or a bank over another wherever you choose to do your banking, 
um, make sure you're uh, touching base. I mean, it's something I'm still trying to work with my teams on to make sure we're out there understanding clients' needs um, on a regular basis. We're not trying to sell anything. What we're saying is, what are you having challenges with? What do you need some help with? And for us, it may just be referring someone to another advisor somewhere that we're just trying to provide help with. So this concept of relationship, which will keep evolving and it has evolved over 30 years, I think coming out of um, this crisis, just like coming out of the 0809 crisis is gonna yield a different type of perspective. I hope that's one that evolves, that asking for help, getting opinions, talking to someone before a crisis in your own business space becomes too big, get that help up front. It's really important. Great, thank you. How about yep. um, Janine and Bill? Yeah, so I don't think uh, we've talked about this today, but it is important wherever possible to preserve your credit score. So by speaking with your lenders, if you get a deferral, my understanding is, and maybe Lisa, you can confirm this, but my understanding is that that will not be a black mark against your credit score. So you're correct, thing, I think, and it is correct. Yeah, correct. So, so that's another reason why you really need to speak with all of your credit card holders, your banks, any any line of credit. You know, your car loan. Everybody understands what's going on. So if you pick up the phone and call and tell them that you need a deferral, ask for a deferral. Um, they give you the deferral. That will help preserve your credit score. Very, very important for um, moving forward. And um, I, I would also, um, you know, echo what Peter was saying about the Paycheck Protection Program. You have to use the funds for what it's supposed to be used for. It won't be forgiven. And I, I do think there's potential for some. I don't know if it's going to be fraud or just misunderstanding. People are so um, desperate and, and in need of funds. I'm not sure they're going to live up to the intent of the law. And so I would just caution everybody to, if you have any questions, you know, give your lender a call, give your banker a call, give us a call, give SCORE a call, because we can help you walk through um, that calculation on the forgiveness piece. I would just add that, uh, as Matt has said, communication is the key. Don't be afraid to ask for help. If you think you may qualify, don't disqualify yourself because you don't think that you're going to be eligible. If you think you have any chance of uh, government help or any other help that's out there, reach out to a resource that may be able to help you. And again, don't be afraid to, uh, to ask for the help. And if you think you are qualified, then move forward because it's an opportunity to opportunity that uh, is necessary for long-term viability of businesses out there in, in the community. So uh, communicate and ask for help is what I would, uh, I would uh, also suggest. Wonderful. Any last minute thoughts, Matt? Before Just the five points I mentioned, create the cash flow forecast, identify your team, communicate, be proactive in those discussions and be persistent with your updates and your analysis and your communication. Thank you. Do we have any final questions out in the group? Um, I think that all of our speakers have made it clear that they're available to, to help. And of course, CCYP is here to help you if you don't uh, feel comfortable speaking up today. Um, but feel free to pop those in the chat box and we can get those addressed before we wrap up. I don't see any coming through, no burning questions today. So I wanna thank all of our speakers. Thank you all so much for your time. I know you're all super busy right now. Uh, Lisa and Peter from the Cooperative Bank, Matt Cronin from Boardwalk Business Group and Janine Marshall and Bill Flynn from Coastal Community Capital. We appreciate everything that you're doing for our community right now. Um, thank you for supporting our small businesses and nonprofits through this uh, really challenging time. And we are uh, looking forward to providing more information. So anything that we can do to get the word out, uh, please let us know and we look forward to helping out. And good luck everyone. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for putting together. Yep. Bye.